Hello, everybody. Welcome to our webcast, Finding Time and Budget for Talent Acquisition. We have two guests today to help us rethink well, how we approach the idea of talent acquisition and funding for it. Our guests today are, it are, is, <laughs> are, anyway, Alan Lesher, the CEO of uh, the YMCA of the Inland Northwest, and Benjamin Friedman, CEO of Wiser Innovation. And I'm, oh, and me, I'm Sonia Llewellyn, the Director of Program Development at 501. So thank you both for being here and taking the time to talk with us about this really often overwhelming subject, especially now. So before we jump into our subject, I'd like to tell you a little bit about 501c Services. 501c Services is, we are now in our 40th year of working with nonprofits with our HR services program and our unemployment outsourcing. And we currently provide services to over 3,000 nonprofits worldwide. Our programs include our 501c Trust, which offers a comprehensive suite of risk management services and tax avoidance solutions for our 501c3 nonprofit members. And our 501c HR services program. The HR services program is a high touch confidential resource to help walk nonprofits of all shapes and sizes, just like yours, through challenging common and not so common HR situations and issues. Plus we offer many HR focused webinars like this one for you and your leadership team. Many of you who are tuned in today are already working with us and I really wanna give you a big shout out and say thank you very much for doing so. Okay, a little bit of housekeeping. I'm gonna buzz through this so we can get on with our program. Everybody's on mute. However, I really want this to be interactive and meaningful to each of you that have tuned in and your organization. So please ask questions, share thoughts and information as it comes up for you. We are really hopeful that you will engage with us as it's such a, it's a much richer, robust conversation. Uh, we have a, the chat function open as well as the question box is up and open and ready for your comments or questions. <clears throat> this session is certified for SHRM credits only this time. Um, so any of you who want the HR certifications, great, let us know. We also have a certificate of participation available. There will be a survey that pops up at the end of the webcast when we close out, um, as well as in the follow-up email, there will be a link. So in the survey, you're gonna be able to request any and all of the uh, certificates, as well as an opportunity to give us feedback on how we did. We read all of your comments and suggestions because it matters to us. And through your constructive feedback, we make improvements. Okay, gentlemen, are you ready? Let's do it. <laughs> All right, Alan, you're up first. What do you believe is the biggest issue as to why nonprofits struggle with talent acquisition? The biggest issue, thank you, Sonia. You're I, welcome. You know, I think, I think the biggest issue with nonprofits is our ability to articulate our employment brand, to talk about what sets us apart from other employers and talk about, you know, how our work is so important in the community. I think with, with nonprofits, all too often, we're quick to talk about how nonprofits pay less than entities in the for-profit world. We we even come across as apologetic in a lot of cases. And what we should really be doing is talking about the special and unique ways that we help our communities 
and the experience within our organizations when you are employed there. And, and if we go down the pay path, I think we also, in, instead of being apologetic, we also need to be talking about the other benefits we provide, health insurance, retirement plans, flexible schedules, positive work experiences. I think we really, we really need to focus on the positive aspects of, of an experience working with one of our nonprofits. I like that. And I, I think you're dead on and a lot of opportunity. I always think that that's the nonprofits offer a lot of opportunities for growth and development as well as really rich, robust benefits. So Benjamin, as a CEO and talent acquisition professional, with your very own nonprofit experience working for and with nonprofits, what do you see in your practice um, that you believe are the biggest issues? Well, to start, I, I definitely agree with Alan. I think employer branding is, is absolutely critical, but I think it's part of a larger issue. And right now, what I'm finding a lot is organizations don't truly understand what talent acquisition is. And they don't fully, because they don't fully understand it, they're not able to fully embrace it and to act on it accordingly. Um, you know, it, it, there needs to be an understanding that talent acquisition is an umbrella term that includes recruiting, it includes employer branding, it includes data management, uh, it includes compliance, and it's really a broad-based function that needs to be a function in and of itself. Um, and I think because of that, because of that lack of understanding and a lack of capacity to fully um, provide for this function, there are a lot of struggles and there are a lot of deficits both to what Alan's speaking about in terms of branding and properly marketing the organization, but also being able to go out and find talent, being able to go out and once you find that talent, engage them so they wanna be part of your organization. Um, there are so many groups that just say, you know, pass hiring off to a, a program manager or an HR person, and that really doesn't do justice to what they need to do and what really is involved in bringing on the talent that is best for the organization. And I think people do get tripped up by talent acquisition and hiring. Mm -hmm. You know, that they think they're interchangeable. And hiring, as you said, is a vital component, but it's talent acquisition is more than that yes if we think of you know I, I like to use food analogies if we think of talent acquisition as a pizza hiring is one slice recruiting is just one slice of that pizza and to alan's point employer branding is another slice of that pizza right. um, that data management and having the right applicant tracking system and the right um database of resumes uh, you know is another slice of that pizza right. um, and so that's what we need to think about because it's not just posting and praying you know you get applicants or just you know making a move all right i need you know a a camp counselor because summer's coming up all right let's go get a camp counselor it's it's that's really not doing justice to what your organization needs. Right. Okay, so based on what you've just said and just shared, mm -hmm. what do you think are a key are a few key things that nonprofits can do when either setting up a talent acquisition program or revamping it, tuning it up, giving it a tune up? Absolutely. So I think the first thing that they need to do is really learn what talent acquisition is, what it means, and what it's involved in. Because talent acquisition is a strategic function where you're building a long-term strategy to not just maintain, but to grow your team 
in an alignment with your overall business strategy. And what I'm seeing right now, I think there needs to be a, a shift in the paradigm where we need to start understanding that the relationship between talent acquisition and human resources needs to mirror the relationship between development and finance. And, and the reason I use that analogy is your finance team is responsible for managing the money, but they also are responsible for setting budgets, for determining um, where allocations need to go. They're responsible for deciding between unrestricted funds and restricted funds. So your finance team may set the strategy or set the goals for the year based on what you have and what you need. And then your development team is responsible for going out and securing that. Well, it's the same thing with talent acquisition and human resources. Human resources should be doing that strategic work of, all right, we're gonna be starting this program, we're gonna need five people. Talent acquisition is responsible for going out and getting those people. And just as you may not want your controller being responsible for major gifts because they're not a salesperson, it's the same thing. Where talent acquisition is a sales function. And because of that, that's why we need the market. We need to do our marketing. We need to do all of the same activities that your development team does. But instead of us going out and trying to get funding, we're going out and trying to get people. Right. People that go get that funding. And so I think what's really critical in setting up or revamping a talent acquisition program is really thinking about what the organizational priorities are today and tomorrow and understanding that if you really want to be successful in your number one resource, which I don't care what your mission is, number one resource of every organization is people. In my mind, it is making that talent acquisition a standalone function to work in parallel with HR, just the same way that your development team is a standalone function working in parallel with finance. And I think that that's an un common viewpoint and I think that there's a lot of merit to rethinking how we think about hiring and talent acquisition and, and all the components. Uh, um, it, it absolutely is an uncommon viewpoint and that's where I go you know that, that's why I say we need to change the the paradigm we need to shift the mindset because we no longer live in an environment where you can just throw up a job and you get the applicants that you need. Um, right. We now have compliance and legal issues that require us to have certain things set up so that if we get audited in a year and a half, we're not getting huge fines. Right. And Alan, you look like you were going to add to that. I'm... I am affirming that because that is so important. I, I love this conversation because making it stand alone gives it the importance that it deserves. It's not just one of many tasks that an HR person has or the accounting department or your communications department. Right. It's this is focused work. Exactly. Thank you. Because I think that gets lost sometimes in the scope and reach, you know, all the things that HR, your HR department takes care of, you know, it's again like that pizza. Mm -hmm. There's employee relations and et cetera. So great. So Alan, what about you? What's worked for you and your why? And what changed during the, the pandemic for you? And how has that impacted your current hiring environment? Well, it really, you know, during the pandemic, we we laid off a lot of people. At one time, I think we laid off almost 700 staff. So then we had to go through the process of bringing them back. And so that really forced us to look at that process. A lot of individuals just came right back but that also left us a lot of positions. And so we had to look at the entire process and 
the the biggest thing is we had to make it easier to apply for a position and to go through that process and so if, if people were finding the process too difficult internally and externally that was slowing things down it, there was too many barriers to our managers to get in a position posted to updating job descriptions because we did change some of our positions as well and then on the on the consumer side if you will it had to be a lot easier i you know for those of you that can see me i started in a paper system of applying for jobs but but now a lot of our applicants expect it to be fully electronic very simple process and and the other thing they expect is that we're going to get back to them right away you know we can't we can't have our hiring managers or our hr staff waiting until a position closes two weeks later to start contacting all of the applicants we're we're doing that in real time now because it's important and that first candidate might be the best candidate so and then and then the other thing for us is we really focused on the onboarding of those individuals because we want them to have a pleasant experience coming into the organization and we also want to do a better job of preparing them for the jobs they're doing one of the one of the things that that we're really excited about is we started a new employee cohort where small groups of of our new employees particularly in the director positions but in we were planning on expanding that to other positions as well they're grouped together in groups of 10 or less and then they go through programs to learn about the organization our programs uh, so there's there's some of the basic nuts and bolts but at the same time they are meeting nine other people that are new to the organization and they're also meeting a lot of our leadership team because we participate in those programs so they may spend an hour with me they may spend a couple of hours with our cfo and and all of our vps of operations and then program directors hr department and so at the end of a 10-week period they know a lot of people they have a lot of contacts inside the organization and so we're we think that's going to really improve the experience for them i would think so absolutely and to me that's all part and parcel of talent acquisition you don't just hire them and let them go it's a piece of the puzzle you want that whole picture filled in i think that's a great idea so benjamin how can organizations adapt to what's going on or trending in talent acquisition well you know i think that all starts with looking inward um and and i really love what alan did you know at looking at his process and it's something that i like to talk to organizations about which is auditing what you're doing um you know audits are not a bad thing if they're done in the right way like you never want to be audited because you have know, tax fraud like that's not a fun audit but auditing for process improvement is is a good thing and all organizations should do it and so that's where i would tell organize, organizations to start you know, when was the last time you looked at your policies and procedures? When was the last time you looked at your technology? When was the last time you looked at your strategy? And so really starting with auditing the function and seeing what you're doing well, talking to candidates that may have been turned away from a job, you know, talking to candidates who were accepted and, and hired, um, talking to your hiring managers, you know, apply for a job yourself. Um, I think that's a great thing that people need to do. Go through the process. You know, think about yourself as an applicant. If you've been with the company for five years, you haven't done it in a long time. You know, do you really want to copy everything in your resume onto a Word document so that it's redundant? Do you really want to have to ask people, um, you know, for a cover letter? I mean, are you? Are you really reading them? I understand you may want a writing sample, but give something appropriate for your job. Um, you know, but writing a generic cover letter, to be honest, a lot of candidates just gonna say no. Um, do you have 
you know, to Alan's point, are, do you have a system that people can apply over their phone? Are you set up to text with your candidates? Um, you know, are you able, you know, depending upon where people are, do you, you know, and I just learned this from a recruiting experience. I just finished hiring somebody in England um, using WhatsApp, you know, and that was new technology for me, but I evolved because I realized that what, that's what was best for my candidates. And that's what they use there. Yeah. Right. And so it's really starting with auditing what you're doing. And then once you do that and you see what's effective and what isn't effective, then it's putting a plan together so that you can evolve your system. Um, one of the key things that we're finding right now, um, and, and Alan spoke to this, is speed. If you're spending two weeks waiting to get back to candidates, one, they probably have other jobs. And two, okay. they're gonna be of the mindset that you don't really care and it's not really a priority. Even if it's an email to a candidate and going, thank you for your application, we've got it. We're gonna start setting up interviews. Today's the fifth, we're gonna start setting out interview requests on the eighth. Okay. If that time if there's an issue with that timeline please let us know but this way candidates are engaged okay. they're involved um i think all of those things are really really critical you know what i'm finding is a lot of organizations can point to external things you know with regards to why they're struggling with hiring and truthfully i find that it's usually not external things you know, it's not that, oh, there aren't candidates. There are right. candidates. You're not appealing to them or you're not actively engaging them. You can't be passive. You know, oh, our salaries are too low. Well, when you're posting your job, are you letting people know what the salary range is? Yeah. Are, you, are you having a conversation with a candidate who says, yeah, I need $10,000 more and go, okay, I can't do $10,000, but are there other things that we may be able to work out? You know, that what if, you know, what if I, I you know, made it a four day work week? Um, you know, what if, you know, this, what if that? Um, and it's really thinking creatively. Um, and to Alan's earlier point about benefits, a lot of that can offset things. It's, it's not black and white. And sometimes what people don't realize and this one is really, really important. If I have a 5% or 10% match on your 401k or your five, you know, or your, you know, whatever your retirement, your Roth, whatever it is, I'm actually giving you more money that you just don't know. So it's important to not only talk about salary, but total compensation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, it's important to go, all right, well, this organization is going to pay you $10,000 more. I'm going to work you 30 hours a week and give you five weeks vacation. You know, does that offset? And it's important to have these conversations, even if it doesn't work out with that person. One of the things most critical to me as a talent acquisition professional, and this is where the sales side goes into it, I want referrals. I want that candidate that I don't hire to refer three people to me. So, get that? It's that relationship, it's that bond, it's all of those things that we don't do when we're not doing this effectively. Same as your, and I go back to my analogy, your development people, you know, whether or not they bring in money from somebody, they want referrals, they want introductions. And when I'm hiring, I don't know if I'm talking to somebody who could be a donor, but even if they don't get hired, but they have a good experience, they're gonna talk positively about my organization. Exactly. Word of mouth, especially because we are community-based groups, that word of mouth is so brilliantly important. That reputation is so vital to what we do. It, you know, both in terms of members, both in terms of funding, and in terms of hiring. And so these are the things that I would tell organizations to do. And when you're investing in this function appropriately, and you have somebody who knows how to go out and find people and engage people and network with people, one, your time to fill becomes a lot higher, but even more importantly than that, the 
relationship and the experience and what that means for the organization over the long haul is really almost immeasurable. And then you complement it with some of the things that Alan was talking about with a really strong onboarding program. I love the cohort thing. Um, I would even advocate one more step, which is a first year mentor for new people. And it, and when I say new people, it's not just new people to the organization, but it's pe people in the organization to a new position. Um, I would also advocate that organizations start building and in a way manufacturing their own staff. You know, one of the things I tell people, one of the most important things in a talent acquisition strategy is retention. If I'm able to take somebody from an intern, make them an entry level employee, build them up in three years to their manager, in five or six years they're a director, that retention, that institutional knowledge is critical. And then I'm building up from underneath. Um, and that's one of the things that we have to start thinking about is what are we doing with people that are passionate for what we do? What are we doing to engage them? And what are we doing to grow them? Um, exactly. That so is like really critical. So Matt, do we have any questions? Great information that I'd love to see. Um, folks have any questions or, or comments or thoughts? Not yet, no. Okay, great. Well, please folks, please don't hesitate to, I mean, what's working in your organization? Um, have, you, have you tried out a new process or revamped something? I think most of us have adopted some different practices and things because it has been challenging in different ways in different organizations. So, all right. So we all know that most nonprofits have limited resources, whether that's time or money or both. So I'd like to hear from both of you some thoughts um, to perhaps help us overcome this. So what, you know, Alan, um, what's been going on in, in your organization in that area? And then Benjamin, I'd love to hear from you. I think some of the big things for us are we're looking at this as there's there's no single solution to this to this right. challenge. You we're gonna we're gonna have to put more money into the talent acquisition process. Yeah. That if you're not prepared to do that. I, uh, I, that's, that's just a huge stumbling block for everyone. You're probably going to be paying more for advertising to, uh, for those open positions. And you're not necessarily going to use a single platform. What's that? Yes. I might have to use WhatsApp this time. I might have to use LinkedIn. So you're going to look at those things. Um, your recruiting activities. Are you, are you participating in job fairs? Do you have an individual who serves as that 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 faith of the organization that's going out and and talking to people are you are you paying hiring bonuses are you paying finders fees to staff who who recruit people for you they should be rewarded for that work if you're going to pay someone else to do it exactly. and and you know are you so you're going to pay people to do that are you then paying retention bonuses to some of those key people that are staying with you because they're watching and they're gonna also see those bonuses paid by someone else to move on. You know, what are you doing in the areas of employee recognition? We've really, we've really ramped up the work that we're doing in that area, staff events. And I think, you know, one of the things that, that costs us very little in terms of the communicating with staff and particularly the newer staff is, you know, we love this concept of the reverse mentorship. Are we as leaders going out and talking to staff and asking them about what, what we should be doing? Now my, my favorite question when I do staff chats is what, what should I know? And I learned so much from 17, 18, 19 year olds who say you you're doing this that that doesn't mean anything to us we don't even know what you're talking about you haven't explained it well 
And, and so you, you should do this. And, and I take that learning and it's been just incredibly important. And I think the other thing for us too is, is because we've had a large number of openings, we've had to focus on key openings. We can't, we can't hit all of this at the same time. So let's, let's be strategic about this. Are these revenue generating positions? Let's maybe we need to focus on those for the for the sustainability of the organization. And then the other thing that we've really had to do a better job of is listening to our HR folks because they're they're a great resource to say you, we shouldn't be doing this. We should be doing this. To do that, we need more money. And 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 it's just been incredibly helpful for us. I think you guys have developed a pretty strong process that are very committed to your employee engagement you know through all cycles of of um, working within your organization we're, we're looking at our process now as constantly evolving and a lot of that has to do with the feedback you know the other the other thing that we're really trying to focus on too we we talk about those individuals benjamin you know great point about the the person who doesn't get the job or doesn't take the job, becoming one of our advocates, our better, our best recruiters. At the same time, it's, it's those individuals that maybe have been with the organization for a long time and are now leaving. Have we made it a positive experience for them throughout their career with our organization? And have we made the exit process a positive experience as well? Because we want them to have that that last thought as an employee was that was that was a great place to work. I yeah. loved working with those people. I loved that organization, and I would recommend that to my friends. We we do surveys and we're always looking at net promoter scores and we're trying to improve. How do we improve what people are saying, even even if they've decided to leave the organization? And we think that's just super important. Communication key. Benjamin, do you have thoughts on that? I, I do. And, you know, I I love what Alan is saying um, about the investment and the function. Um, you know, and, you know, I, I think it is critical that there are financial resources allocated. Um, one thing that's important to understand, we don't, we no longer operate in an environment where we're competing against nonprofits for talent. Um, we're competing against a whole a whole system. So your nonprofit is also competing against the for-profit. It's also competing against the government job. Um, it's also competing against the entrepreneurs trying to start their own their own business. And so we really need to understand that our candidates have options, and we need to understand that if someplace is going to be offering them fifteen dollars more an hour. Well, maybe they'll think, well, I'll just come volunteer for an hour or two a week, and then I'll feel good about myself, or I'm helping. Um, so we really need to understand what the job market looks like. Um, we also need to understand that, you know, in in doing this, sometimes less can be more. Uh, and what I say about that is a lot of organizations like to have a huge amount of robust programs. Sometimes it's even better to specialize and have three or four core programs that are fully staffed with really talented people before you move on to program five, six, and seven. And it's not that you're not serving your community, it's you're actually serving your community better because you have all the resources allocated for those programs. Um, and that's something that affects, you know, a wide variety of organizations. If you can't afford to fully staff, you shouldn't be doing it because you're doing a disservice. Um, and that's something that people don't often think about because they think, well, if I don't do this, who will? Well, you can, you just have to wait till you're ready. Um, and that's where the strategy the organizational strategy and the talent acquisition strategy 
really come together because the worst thing that we can do is really provide a half of a service to 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 our people um you know i love you know some of the things that alan was saying you know in about listening to your team members um let's be real honest there's generational gaps there's gender gaps there's all these different experiential gaps and mm -hmm. we cannot be so arrogant as leaders as to think we know things um <laughs> we're gonna have a if, if our goal is a diverse team then it has to be a an inclusive diverse team where we're actually listening and then we're making adjustments um you know my experience is not the same as yours alan or the same as yours so when you talk to me it behooves me to learn something and then act on it um and i love that reverse mentorship that you were talking about because i'll be honest you know i don't know all the new technology that might be valuable to reach a certain population so for me to talk to somebody who has a different experience for whatever reason and go oh wow i didn't know that let's start incorporating that one i'm a better leader for it and i know me personally and a lot of the people i work for being that good leader is important um valuing our teams is important but if we want to get the people we don't have who are important for our growth, listening to them is critical. And then implementing it, when, when you listen to your team and you implement and they feel valued, it, you know that's bigger than a 2.5 or 5% raise. When you show people they're appreciated, um, that's your best talent acquisition strategy is to appreciate your team and for them to advocate on your behalf. Um, so I think what you're doing with that, Alan, is is spectacular. Thank you. I, think so too. I agree. So before we got, talk a little bit more into how we talk to our CEOs and CFOs to get buy-in and to explain the process, um, Matt, I think we've got a couple of questions. Yes, the, um, there, uh, you all talked earlier about um, effective hiring bonuses. Can you kind of go over a, uh, the best practices when we're talking about hiring bonuses, how long they have to be employed before they get the money, if you've seen any kind of spectrum of that, or if you all recommend a certain way to do hiring bonuses? Um, I'm, you want to go first, Alan? Well, I'm sure. I, you know, I think I think it varies by positions. And I, I so some of them tend to be very short timeline. We're, we're not going to require them to stay for six months or a year to get to get a, a smaller hiring bonus. We're going to make that an immediate satisfaction item. If it becomes a retention bonus, let's let's look at it as a retention bonus. Now you've stayed with us for a period of time. That's that's not the same in our eyes. They're two different things. One is we're rewarding you for joining our team. The other is we're rewarding you for staying on the team. That's awesome. Yeah, and, and it, that mirrors a lot of what I was going to say. And it's important when you're giving out bonuses to be very transparent with what the bonus means and how it works. Um, I've worked in a lot of organizations where they do all right, we're going to do a hiring bonus. It's, you know, fifteen hundred hours when you sign on, fifteen hundred hours after ninety days, and then you know, twenty five hundred hours after six months. The problem with that is the second fifteen hundred and the twenty five hundred, or whatever it is for your organization. To Alan's point, those are retention bonuses. Right. Hiring bonuses, I believe, should be immediate. Um, I believe also that you want to be very careful with the strings that you attach to it um there are a lot of organizations that put stipulations with um clawbacks on those bonuses which i personally am not a big fan of um will there be people that try to gain the system absolutely of course um, 
you know, there will be people that will try to get a job, try to get, you know, the 500 hours and then walk away. Yeah. You know, that happens, but that's not the majority of people. Right. Uh, and I think most people, especially the people that are trying to work with us, um, they get that bonus. It's for me, it gets paid out on that first paycheck or the second paycheck, you know, whichever is the first full cycle. Um, that's when they get that bonus and it's for joining the organization. That's what it, that's what it means. Um, you know, and if somebody does game the system, you know, it's unfortunate, but, you know, unlike other things, you know, you, you buy a car, you have a car, you know, you hire a person, people think, you know, and, uh, you know, and, and that's just the reality of it. But in my experience, most people have good intentions and go into it honestly I and appreciate so. that. Yeah. yeah. Matt, are there other questions or comments, things that folks have shared? Uh, we have a couple of people who were wondering if there was a place they could go to get a sample or starter talent acquisition strategy or maybe best practices, FAQ or something like that. And yeah, that's like in your wheelhouse. <laughs> that, that is in my wheelhouse. So there's two pieces to this. Um, one is the compliance piece, the legal piece of it. And that varies state by state, city by city. Um, so for the compliance piece of it, I would recommend, you know, either look, you know, talking to your, your legal team, you know, what are the, you know, your employment lawyer, what are things that I need to be aware of? Um, and in most places, you can actually look that up. Most cities, most municipalities um, will share on a website the things that you need to do. I know where I am in um, Washington State and Seattle, you know, there it's clear as day. I hire somebody new, I got to do A, B, C, and D. Um, right. You know, so that's on the legal side of it. Um, with regards to the practical application of it, you know, there are some best practices out there, um, but a talent acquisition strategy needs to be unique to your organization. Um, you know, and it, you know, I would say, you know, there are a lot of YMCAs. I work for the YMCA, a YMCA branch in Queens, New York, uh, which is part of a huge YMCA system in, in New York City. But what worked for my branch would not necessarily work for our sister branch five miles away. And so when you're doing that strategy, it really needs to be unique to your organization um, because of who your membership is, what your hiring goals are. Um, you know, is your strategy to hire 200 people in the next six months or is it to hire four people over the next three years? And that's why, you know, that's why that strategy has to be individualized. I, but I think that maybe you and I, Benjamin, can work on something to share with our group that's a template, you know, that are some basic uh, first steps. So let's work on that. That's yeah, a great oh, question. No, absolutely. And I think it is a great question. Um, I just, you know, it's important to understand that just like a fundraising strategy is unique to an organization, this has to be unique as well with the complexities. Absolutely. So, Mac, um, any other questions? Um, not right now. Okay. All right. We'll come back to that one. Okay. Alan, you're up. <laughs> so, help us to work through the message or the ask to our CFOs and CEOs because we want to get buy-in for them to understand what we're trying to do and that it's best for the organization but it's always you know the money issue how do we get buy-in for additional funding and staffing resources so what might and what might a CEO say to a the board and funders uh, to get them invested and on board with helping to obtain funds for talent acquisition. That's a long question. <laughs> that is that one question. 
<laughs> no, it's really two. <laughs> You know, I, I, going to, you know, over to Benjamin's wheelhouse, you know, that the data component of this is key when you're, I think, when you're trying to communicate that to, to especially the CFOs, they, they like to see numbers. So, you know, what is, you know, focusing on these, the, the funding, the revenue components, you know, the ability for staff but fully staffed programs to to generate additional revenue I, is is going to be key because that's going to allow you to deliver that mission that that really that's what you're trying to do at the end of the day and I think you know the facts about the data on number of open positions your turnover rates things like that that's that's key as well because if some of those if some of those measurements are being taken on a regular basis and you can see trends, you can then make a case to, to take action to affect those trends. This is going in a, in a positive direction. That means this talent acquisition work we're doing is, is effective. Okay. If it's not, then our, then our work, it, it needs to be more robust. We need to put more resources in this. And it really goes, I think, to the to the board and the funders as well. A lot of that same information, you know. And then the other thing is getting getting feedback from your staff. We we just keep going back to how important that is, but that's also information that you can share with the CFOs, the CEOs, the CEOs and the and the board and the funders are probably going to love the softer components more than and i always pick on the cfos because i came from that world so so i i feel like i can do that but but it's you know that's also important but at the end of the day when you're asking for this funding you have to make a compelling argument and a lot of that goes back to that data yeah i think it always comes back to showing yeah, what's your time to hire? You know, how long does it take to, you know, find a candidate or candidates and then the interview and the, the whole process, the whole from start to finish. And if you're using that same data to show that some of these programs are effective, right? That that's perfect. That's that's the way we should be doing things. Look, I asked you to invest in in this. We did, and look at how effective it is. Right. So it's not just the initial ask, it's then sharing that information that it's working. Exactly. Um, all right. Benjamin, thoughts on this and um, maybe some helpful words or something that might be different from, from Alan's take? Absolutely. And I'll, I'll go different in a minute. One of the things that I want to do to add to what Alan is saying, you know, the, you know, as you're sharing the data, one of the important things that I find, especially with CFOs and especially with boards, is when you show them the cost of not having people and the expense on the organization, how much it costs an organization to have an open position, how much it costs in overtime, how much the strain is on the people you have, and how that open position leads to turnover. Um, that's critical. The, piece of it that i would also say you know most people that are on the board of a nonprofit are there because they believe in the mission most people that work at a nonprofit are there because they believe in the mission that is a tremendous tremendous asset in making a case you know our mission is to do this whether it's you know, feeding people, housing people, recreation programs, education programs, medicine, whatever it is, our missions are important. And so we have to be able to package that argument while appealing to our mission. It, it can't just be a black and white argument. And I think when we're able to appeal to our missions and speak to how it takes people to achieve our mission, it takes people to fundraise. It takes people, as I was saying earlier, to interact with our populations. It takes people to do that. People are our number one resource. 
externally and internally. And so if we're taking all that data, we're aligning it to mission and then we're bringing it to people because we don't have a, we don't have a mission, we don't have an organization without people. And when we make that case and we show how if I invest in a talent acquisition professional and that professional is able to then bring our organization up to 98% capacity and how that affects our culture, how that affects the members that we service, I think that piece is just as valuable and makes a human case it makes a mission-driven case that aligns with what Alan is saying. And I think you need both sides of it because it can't just be a passion play. You know, there has to be things that back it up, um, but you can't just throw numbers out there without explaining, you know, why this is critical. You know, at the end of the day, if you're an organization that helps young people with getting over trauma, you can't do that without therapists. Right. That's just the reality. Um, you know, so that's what I would say to complement what, what Alan has brought to the table. So make sure, ensure that you have not only that important data, mm -hmm. also the human connection piece of, you know, remind, every, remind them of the mission and mm -hmm. that we need people to fulfill that in order to make it happen. So Absolutely. making that passion plea, the, the human connection a lot, and then make that work with the numbers. Absolutely. Okay. It, it's a power, it, it, it leads to a very powerful case that is very hard to argue with. Right. All right. I'd like to spend a few minutes, I see that we do have some questions about retention. Um, and I want to get to them. And then we've, we've had some comments about, uh, I asked for feedback from our folks that are listening about what they do, what's worked for them. And one person said that they start their interviews and their whole process with explaining their culture and their benefits. So I think when people hear what the culture is, what your culture is, and then they, experience that and then they hear about the benefits so that's worked for for that organization and i would imagine that that would work for most organizations ellen it sounds like you guys do that um really well we we try we try and i and i think that's where it goes back to that that constantly evolving process because you might feel like you're doing it great right now. Things change a little bit. And if, <laughs> if you're not tweaking that system, all of a sudden you're you're not as great as you once were. Right. Right. And things change on a dime. <laughs> they do. They do. We, we all know that. that during the pandemic. <sighs> yeah. <sighs> all right. So I'd like to hear from you both. Benjamin, we'll start with you, and I want to finish it with you, Alan. Benjamin, what's one thing that folks remember nothing else? What's one thing that you want them to take away from our time together this morning? The one thing I want you to take away is it's time to change the paradigm. If you key in on anything that I said, think about the analogy. Talent acquisition to HR is equivalent to development and finance. Your HR team is there to manage people once they're there. Same as your finance team is there to manage money once it's in the organization. Your development team is there to bring those funds in. Your talent acquisition team is there to bring those people to the organization. Understand that these are parallel functions, but they are separate functions. And if you're going to do right, whether it's fundraising or whether it's bringing people to the organization, there are, it is a specialized skill set of professionals that 
exclusively do these things and do them very well. And so that would be my one takeaway is that paradigm shift and that analogy. Okay, Alan, what's one thing that you want folks to remember from today? I, I would like everyone to remember that, you know, we're, we always talk about focusing on the culture within our organization. And so let's look at when we focus on that culture within our organization as starting at the moment where that potential applicant is considering pressing a button and applying with our organization. It doesn't start once they get here. It starts back there. And we want that to be a positive experience. And then we want them to come in. We, we want to nurture them early on so they feel welcome, so they feel informed. And then we want to start listening to staff through whatever means. We want to be communicating with them. We want to create a perpetual learning environment for them. And we, we want this to be a positive experience as part of this culture up until the time they leave, because we need to remember, as Benjamin, Benjamin said, that person could be our, our best recruiter yeah. or they could be one of our best donors. Right. And so that all goes back to that cultural experience within our organization from that very point in time where they, they don't work for us yet, but they're thinking about it. I love that. All right, I think we're done. Um, we've got a couple comments and um, somebody was asking about employment, um, annual reviews, and I think that annual reviews, it's a whole different subject, but I do think it's important for retention. So, um, and the gentleman who posted that question, call, let's talk about it. Um, and we can we can talk in depth about that if you'd like. So thank you everybody for uh, joining us today. We really hope that you've given you all some actionable suggestions and advice to use in your own organizations, or at least to spark the conversations around talent acquisition and retention and all those good things to keep our good people. So join us next month. Um, May 10th, we're going to talk about the great re resignation and strategies on maintaining the nonprofit workforce. So all keys into what we've been talking about. We look forward to seeing you there. And if you'd like more information on our services, uh, please feel free to uh, reach out to either Benjamin or myself or to Mac. Um, he's manning the slides. <laughs> Um, and we will get that um, information to you, that contact information. So don't forget the short survey, the certificates, and your feedback. That's really important to us. And thank you both, Alan and Benjamin, for joining us today and sharing your wisdom with us. And um, we just were, we're glad you took the time to talk with us. And thank you, everybody who participated and listened. So. We're done. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.